some parts of BT and um, Fraunhofer Institute. Um, <coughs> and this was uh, work that went into an IEEE paper, a method for comparing the performance of uh, voice codecs under bursty packet loss, um, including EVS. So <coughs> in the presentation, um, I'll give a brief uh, overview of how the use of IP technology um, is changing in our fixed and mobile networks. Uh, the challenges and opportunities it brings in terms of uh, packet loss, state-of-the-art codecs, and performance characterization, um, and how this has led to the development of a new method uh, for characterizing codecs. So <clears throat> this method, in principle, allows us to um, characterize the performance of codecs under almost any packet loss conditions um, and build a database that can be used to estimate the packet loss-related codec performance on previously untested networks. Um, and finally, I'll show how this method's been applied uh, to characterize the performance of uh, four real-world codec conditions. So uh, some of this is stating the obvious. Um, migration from legacy TDM to IP um, has been happening for some time, but it's really picking up pace now, particularly in the, um, uh, the, the, the across the incumbent uh, telecoms market. So most operators um, in fixed have a plan to migrate from TDM to IP uh, between 2020 and 2025. Um, on the mobile side, as of 2017, um, Volte has been launched in um, over 60 countries. Um, and it's affecting 125 networks. Um, and of course, over the top providers, um, well, they're expecting to see around a five-fold increase in revenue uh, between 2015 and 2020. So um, there's a lot changing at the moment. <clears throat> and that move from TDM to IP introduces some well-known performance challenges um, for network operators and providers. So uh, packet loss in particular can be problematic uh, because it can lead to disturbances that are particularly problematic for audio quality. Um, it can be <coughs> avoided altogether um, with some mechanisms um, like QAS and other mechanisms to protect voice traffic. Um, but there are actually still many cases where a degree of loss may be unavoidable. So things like spurious interference on uh, copper DSL lines, multipath propagation um, in radio access networks. Um, and it's, it's <coughs> probably also fair to say generally that uh, a nominally loss-free network is unlikely to be cost-effective uh, for, for many providers. Um, at the same time, uh, the move to IP opens up opportunities uh, to greatly improve customer experience. So fixed not line no longer being limited to narrowband codecs like G711. Um, mobile operators being able to offer wideband and super wideband calls. Um, and state-of-the-art codecs built with uh, IP networks in mind from the ground up um, can offer better resilience to packet loss using concealment methods and intelligent redundancy schemes. Um, so assuming networks are not um, and cannot be nominally loss-free, uh, but at the same time uh, the net impact um, is heavily influenced by codecs, this gives rise to two key questions. So how can service providers and operators adequately characterize network packet loss? Um, and how can it be related to user experience depending on the codec? So back to basics a bit, but it helps to understand some of the key characteristics of packet loss. So <coughs> packet loss is norm normally described as uh, random loss or bursty loss. Um, and so what we mean by this is that in a stream of packets, random loss tends to be uh, isolated, um, singular lost packets. And in bursty loss, we have consecutive lost packets. Um, and <coughs> loss encountered, although it's quite easy to characterize average loss with simple arithmetic, loss in real networks does tend to be um, uh, bursty because of events occur, uh, causing disruptions that occur over multiple packets. So arguably, random loss alone doesn't fully represent real world, net, uh, real world network scenarios. So because of this, um, many studies uh, model packet loss on uh, time discrete systems um, uh, called Markov chains. Um, the two chain Markov model is the uh, simplest for representing bursty loss, and that's simply represented by uh, P and Q. So P being the probability that uh, any given packet is lost um, on the basis that the previous packet wasn't lost, and Q being that um, a packet a, a given packet isn't lost on the basis that the previous packet was lost. And that can be fully characterized for the overall loss um, as uh, PL, um, P over the sum of P and Q. So pretty straightforward. Um, 
And a really uh, easy way of uh, defining burstiness is through the mean burst length. Um, so that's simply the sum of the uh, burst lengths uh, over the number of bursts. Um, so in this example, if we look at, uh, we've got a, a burst of one. So even uh, a singular loss packet can be defined as a burst, it's a burst of one. Uh, <clears throat> a burst of two, a burst of three, and a burst of one packets. And the mean burst length simply comes out as 1.75 in this example. So using the two-state Markov chain, uh, to define the, the amount of loss, PL, um, and the mean burst length uh, to describe the distribution of loss, um, that changes the second question we've got slightly. So how do we relate overall loss and mean burst length um, for, to user experience based on particular codex? Um, and this is where voice quality testing helps. So this is a, a huge topic, um, but uh, just a couple of, of salient points. Um, so it tends to fall into two categories, uh, subjective testing um, and objective testing. Subjective tests uh, run with human test subjects are ultimately the most reliable way to test voice quality, but they're expensive, difficult to design, and limited by human factors like concentration. Um, the most, uh, one of the, mo or, or, or the most useful objective tests uh, tend to be based on a full reference model like PESC or Polka. So um, in simple terms, we inject a undergraded speech signal into a system under test. Um, that's subjected to all of the degradations applicable to that particular network. Uh, we get the degraded speech, and then we use an algorithm to compare the undergraded um, speech with the degraded speech to generate a MOS score and um, almost fully de de defined. In this case, this is a, a mean opinion score uh, listening quality of, um, of, on using an objective method. So this potentially solves our uh, second question. So assuming we have some means of degrading a reference signal encoded with a particular codec um, and a p particular amount of loss, PL, um, and mean burst length, MBL, um, we can use a suitable full reference uh, uh, measurement technique like Polka to measure the related performance. Um, and this principle um, is behind the uh, new test method in the paper. So um, simply the, the, the process works, um, uh, could be described as a flow. So we select a codec to test, codec I, select an overall um, packet loss rate um, to test, so PLJ, uh, select a mean burst length, um, MBLK, and then with that we generate um, the combination of the overall loss rate and the mean burst length gives us what we've uh, defined as a, a packet loss profile, so PLP, JK. Um, and then, as I said, if we can then create a test environment that allows us to uh, test with a full reference model under that condition from the loss profile, um, then we can obtain a, a mean opinion score. And we can repeat that, obviously, for uh, different loss profiles and for different codecs. Um, there's one slight problem with this. So uh, full reference speech um, tends to include um, gaps, natural gaps, as well as the speech signal. So if we apply the same um, values of, of, of overall loss rate and uh, mean burst length, um, <clears throat> but the loss has actually hit the speech or the gaps in different places, it has a massive impact on the mean opinion score. Um, so a really simple way around that is that we simply have to reiterate um, around here um, N versions of um, our packet loss profile. And in that, <clears throat> I mean that we have um, lots of different uh, packet loss profiles with the same overall loss rate, the same mean burst length, um, but with those the particular losses randomized in time. Um, it means there's a lot of test conditions, um, but as long as that approach can be automated, it's quite feasible to do this. And it has been successfully applied to uh, test for codec conditions. So AMR uh, wideband at 23.85 kilobits per second, um, G722 with Appendix 4 packet loss concealment, um, <coughs> EVS uh, super wideband mode at 13.2 kilobits per second, and EVS with channel aware mode at 13.2 kilobits per second. Um, and in order to get the packet loss profiles, we essentially have to uh, implement our, our two-state model for um, uh, our two-state mark Markov chain. So <clears throat> this can be represented in the form of a grid. So in this case, um, essentially on the, along the x-axis, we've got different values of um, 
our, our overall loss rate, and then for each of those we will have a, a different mean burst length. Um, and you'll spot there are gaps in the in the grids. So <clears throat> this is simply where um, arithmetically it just doesn't work out that you can have a particular combination of a packet loss rate and a mean burst length. So obviously when you're down at quite low levels of overall loss, if you're dropping uh, more consecutive packets, that just doesn't calculate. So that's where the, the gaps occur. Um, in this case, um, the profiles were prepared against uh, 600 packet um, samples, so that's uh, essentially 12 second speech stimulus um, with a 20 millisecond frame. Um, and in terms of our uh, randomization, so each of these uh, blobs in the grid essentially being uh, randomized in terms of the incidence of the losses, which as I mentioned before, for this, to, to take account of speech and gaps, um, uh, uh, 200 times in this case, although that could be increased. Um, so in order to uh, run these tests, um, and having generated the loss profiles, um, essentially the uh, test configuration was to uh, set up um, two SIP clients um, via um, the NS3 network emulator. Um, the process being that um, we, we send our uh, reference audio speech to the audio input of uh, one of the eight, one of the uh, SIP clients. Um, that's our undergraded um, RTP coming out. With the NS3 emulator, um, and this could look like just a simple, the packet loss profiles could simply be a bunch of uh, text files with a one representing no loss condition and a zero representing a loss. So you can create uh, very simply uh, a, a, a range of the, the loss profiles, give that to the network emulator to apply that to the RTP stream, um, and then uh, that gives us our degraded RTP with our packet loss profile applied. Um, and then out of the um, other SIP client, our uh, audio output, which gives us our degraded audio impacted by the packet loss profile. Um, and then if you use a, a, a test system like an Opal Systems DSLA, um, you can automate this process and obtain lots of uh, uh, MOS measurements. And then obviously this can be repeated for different codecs, um, and that's simply by changing the configuration of the SIP clients. So, that gives us a lot of measurements to deal with, um, and we really want a way of visualizing um, the overall loss and the mean burst length. Um, and um, these, hit, the, these are basically heat maps. Um, so along here, similar to the, the grid I showed for the packet loss profiles, we've got the overall loss rate on the x-axis, the mean burst length of the y-axis, um, and each of these blobs is given a um, color coding based on the mean opinion score. So um, obviously if we're, we're blue, we're heading towards five in this case, um, so excellent, um, uh, four being good. Um, and then you get the whole blend right down as you'd expect um, until uh, uh, down to a, a, a pretty uh, bad MOS score as at the uh, high rates of overall loss and mean burst length. Um, and uh, just to reiterate that each of these is, is re each of these measurements has been repeated 200 times. So actually, doing that for the um, four codec conditions creates about 147,000 uh, um, MOS scores. So um, just comparing the heat map, so AMR uh, wideband and G722. Um, so we can see that really the, the overall loss in this case is actually quite dominant. So um, as you uh, 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 push forwards that way if you were say trying to uh, maintain a mean opinion score of, um, of of around three then across all of the mean burst lengths around three percent overall loss or four percent overall loss um, for AMR wideband and G722 respectively and that's irrespective of the, of the mean burst length in this case um, and comparing EVS in channel aware mode uh, uh, with and without channel aware mode, things get a bit more interesting in terms of the mean burst length. Um, so uh, we start to see this characteristic where uh, you may have uh, regions where um, the uh, overall loss rate um, could be higher as long as you constrain the mean burst length to an extent. It's exacerbated in the channel aware mode um, whereby you sort of see this region where up to uh, in this case, maybe 10% um, overall loss rate, you may be able to tolerate more mean burst length. So essentially, that, the, the need for, for representing 
mean burst length as well as the overall loss becomes more, becomes more important for these codecs, some of these codecs. Um, returning to the, the full set, um, it's quite difficult to see the comparisons between, between different codecs. This is quite a good way of visualizing the absolute performance of a codec on, a, uh, on its individual merit. Um, but, for example, it's, it's quite difficult to see the difference between um, AMR wideband and G722. They're fairly similar. A another way of visualizing this is to um, have different um, heat maps. So, in this case, essentially, um, we're looking at EVS with and without channel aware mode. Um, in each case, all we've done is subtracted the mean opinion scores on each point in the grid. So, um, the darker the, the green color in this case, uh, the greater the difference. So comparing uh, EVS without channel aware mode to um, AMR wideband and EVS uh, without channel aware mode with G722, we can see there's a starker difference uh, um, with uh, AMR than there is for G722. Um, comparing with channel aware mode to each codec, you can start to see that the regions um, give us a, 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 a greater difference overall, which is to be expected. But I guess hopefully this demonstrates the, the power of the heat maps to give that visual clue versus the traditional approach of showing uh, 2D measurements of, uh, you know, say, MOS and packet loss. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we've seen how a new methods being devised for characterizing and comparing the performance of codecs under different characteristics of burst packet loss. Um, this particular method uh, enables a complete database of the performance for codecs to be built up under almost pack any packet loss condition, um, and that can be used to estimate packet loss uh, related performance for previously untested networks. Um, and as I've shown, this method's been proven against four codec conditions, um, EVS with and without channel aware mode, AMR wideband, and G722, and the results can be shown in, a corresponding, um, in corresponding heat maps. Um, and hopefully, as I say, the visual provides um, uh, evidence of how powerful those, those heat maps can be for displaying this sort of data. Um, and this method um, has been used uh, in the NICC uh, UK interop standards, um, so it's for contributing um, data on end-to-end -end performance requirements for NGNs. Um, and the insights are also being used to support the rollout of IP voice services um, and networks um, and, and to guide the strate strategic use of state-of-the-art codec technology um, so that the benefits can be seen. So, with that, any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, um, I, I think that the purpose of this is that you could offline build the performance relationship and then separately do the performance qualification. And because that's so dependent on uh, network topology, I mean, I, I give the example of DSL. Um, certainly in the UK, um, yeah, there is a, there is a, there's a lot of copper out there. It's not likely to be replaced with fiber anytime soon. So there are some pretty key characteristics of DSL that, that are cause for concern. So if you can characterize that, so, so if you could measure, for example, the overall loss rate, the mean burst length, and for a given codec, the idea is that you could then um, imply the, the, the performance from there. And, and also to, to set your thresholds of performance. So 